This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilderbeasts, we're going to talk about cat butt science, a carting horse who gave us vaccines and the FDA, and an animal who frequently ends up in the police lineup. Okay, let's go. Hi, everyone. I'm week one into my vaccination. I'm so excited. And that also means that I'll be out in the world again soon, which means I think I'm going to have to take some time off from this show at some point during the summer while I try to figure out how to work with humans again. I have to figure out my work schedule, my teaching schedule, my parenting schedule, and take some time to write and produce some more episodes for everyone here. So stay subscribed, and there will be some fun things popping into your feed during the summer, but I am going to take a little time off after May. I hope to put some special things in during the summer, maybe some more shorties, maybe some interviews. I have a really good book that I'm reading about pigeons who are used in smuggling diamonds in Africa. This show is not going anywhere. I am just going to take a break. So keep sending your story ideas, funny news pieces, and animals who intersect at humanity to email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. And follow all the socials for some sneak peeks, easily shareable audiograms, etc. But before I break in June, we still have a few weeks left of new content. And just watch this space and stay tuned. I will be back with the regularly scheduled broadcast in September with Season 2. But for now, get vaccinated. Until June, we still have some podcasts to make. So ready? Let's get on with the show. There are many things we can say about koalas. Cute, fuzzy, criminal masterminds. It turns out we aren't the only ones who have fingerprints that can get us into trouble. One experiment you can do at a fingerprinting office would be to take some human fingerprints, some chimpanzee fingerprints, and some koala fingerprints. Ask which ones are human and the police would have a coin flip chance of getting it correct without any other information because koalas like chimpanzees and humans have similar fingerprint patterns that can identify an individual. They have whirl and loop patterns just like us. So how likely is it that a koala could be confused as a human in a criminal case? Quote, Although it is extremely unlikely that koala prints would be found at a scene of a crime, Police should at least be aware of the possibility, said Maciej Henneberg, a forensic scientist and biological anthropologist at the University of Adelaide in Australia. Y'all, we've seen on this show a crow who has busted into crime scenes and stole evidence, a cat who solved a murder, bugs who are witnesses in forensic cases, and more. I have no doubt that we will be able to report someday soon on the koala in the lineup. Do you see your assailant? Yes, officer, that's him. Tall, white male mustache? No, the next one over. Fuzzy guy in the ficus. Eating eucalyptus. So criminals who listen to this show, all hopefully zero of you, I'm sure you could train a koala to do the art heist for you. Oh my god. I just solved the Isabella Stewart Gardner heist. Uh... Okay, I'll be back. I have some calls to make. (music) 
Rarely a week goes by without hearing some news about the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration is basically the big arm of public health. I'm sure they've had quite a quiet year. In short, the FDA makes sure that drugs for people and humans are safe. If there's a recall of food because it's contaminated or it makes people sick or has been tainted in some way, you don't want to get cholera from a carrot. I mean, okay, look, I don't even know if you can get cholera from a carrot, but if it's possible, the FDA makes it safe to eat carrots without cholera or something. If there's a new medication on the market, see all those television ads hawking prescriptions? Vaccines. Oh, have those been in the news lately? If you like to wear makeup, it's probably better that it doesn't have arsenic in it, because it used to. They all have to get the stamp of approval from the FDA. The FDA also regulates other things not thought of as ingestible products or makeup. So let's look at lasers. Oh, and products that emit radiation like your cell phones and condoms. They all get the once over by this arm of government, as does other products you might not have thought about ever. Pets and human sperm. Not together. Obviously. At least I hope it's obvious. Those are all under the watchful eye of the FDA. One thing I didn't realize before today was how much the FDA is tied into veterinary stuff. But it makes sense. Human medicine and animal medicine, as you'll find out through the rest of this story, are in many ways inextricably linked. Even when COVID had the highest numbers of people on ventilators in hospitals, animal hospitals were sending ventilators to human hospitals to help in the pandemic effort. There is a possibility that the ventilator keeping a loved one alive was also used in a boxer's dental procedure. Well cleaned, of course. So with an arm of the government that is so big that protects nearly every aspect of day-to-day life, safety in food and drugs and medicine and the very tools we use to communicate like cell phones and our pets and our reproduction in some cases, makeup. Have you ever thought about how this arm of government ever even came to be? Well, it's on this show, so there is an animal to thank. A carting horse named Jim. And on the heels of me getting my second dose of Pfizer, proving once and for all it's not just a little blue pill that promises big, big things. I found it even more fascinating to do this story. So buckle in and let's learn about the second horse named Jim on this show who has gone to change the very course of human history. So let's saddle up and go way back to 1906. Up until this point in history, there's been functionally zero laws regulating what could be sold as medicine. Got a headache? Try some cocaine in your soda. Have a stereo? Try some, well, cocaine in your soda. Pretty sure that just most medicine at this time was putting cocaine in soda, which is not FDA approved, nor is it advised on this show. Did cocaine bear teach you nothing? In fact, had we thought of something like the FDA, the Salem witch trials might never have happened. There is a theory, one that I personally like, that explained the mass hysteria as caused by hallucinogenic fungus called ergot that grows on wheat and rye in very specific conditions. And kids happen to be more susceptible to the LSD-like effect from this ergot poisoning. Conditions that have been confirmed for the time frame in 1692 during the Salem witch trials. Had we had an FDA... 20 deaths by hanging or crushing by stones might have been avoided. And today, Salem, Massachusetts would have just earned its reputation as a, well, a boring town with zero witches. No witchy gift shops and October would just be normal. It's kind of weird to think of bizarro Salem, but here we are. Anyway, investigative journalists discovered that misbranding food and drugs in America was pretty commonplace. Now, we would call them knockoffs, but if I sold a product that was safe and someone else took that name or mishandled it and added their own special sauce to my product and sold it as theirs, that's illegal. Additionally, if I had a product called, well, let's say Totatol, and someone else in this time saw that my product Totatol was selling very well, they could make their own Totatol and use a similar label, similar color scheme, and same name and sell it even if it's just water and rat pee. It'll cure what ails ya, or cause what ails ya. So both of those circumstances are very, very, very illegal, but there were no real laws on the books at the time for those practices. Meanwhile, 
People were buying products trying to look pretty, get healthy, lose weight, all the same song and dance that we still have today, but would potentially make themselves very, very ill because there were zero regulations for these products. Then came along a huge advancement in medicine. If you recall back in episode 10, the dogs who saved a town at the end of the world, the race for mercy with Balto and Togo and the heroic mushers against all odds and against 80 mile an hour winds in a blizzard, were able to get diphtheria antitoxin to the kids, the townsfolk, the indigenous people of the town of Nome, Alaska? That story takes place in January 1925. Without the diphtheria antitoxin, the town at the end of the world would have suffered immeasurable and devastating losses just a few years after the flu pandemic. But we can thank a horse, this horse, for the antitoxin too. Back in old-timey times, horses used to pull carts through the streets. You need milk? Well, there was a legitimate milkman and maybe an illegitimate daddy for the job, but who pulled that milk? The carts of milk that were pulled by horses. Horses like Jim rolled through the streets. Jim was a St. Louis staple. He would pull the carts through the streets of St. Louis every day, bringing milk to the people who would fill milk bottles or cartons or buckets themselves. From the cart that he pulled as the mechanisms to automatically fill glass bottles of milk hadn't been invented. And glass bottles themselves were not commonplace yet. But times were tough as they always seemed to be. Horse owners could make a few extra dollars by selling their horses' blood to science. People in white lab coats could take this donated blood. Though with the language donation, I'm wondering how much consent there was in the best of times in the early 1900s. And the white lab coats and the local firms would make something incredible from this blood. Diphtheria antitoxin. So how did the horse blood help kids with diphtheria? Well, horses were injected with a wee bit of the bad thing. In this case, diphtheria, a bacteria. The horses then make the antibodies, the very thing that helps today when you get a vaccine. And sometimes you feel a little junky after a vaccine, but that's because your body's super fighters, the white blood cells in your immune system are waking up and going on the attack. And the immune system muscle milk that pumps up the white blood cells to fight back against the dangerous illness in the event that you come across it again, like the COVID vaccine. But at the time, horses were injected with things like smallpox and diphtheria and other things at the time, common and deadly illnesses. And the blood would just be extracted from the horses to make these antitoxins. The antitoxins would then be jujitsued into some magic medicine, vaccine, or something to help kids. Y'all, I'm not a doctor. Just go listen to Sawbones. I'm sure they can talk a little bit more expertly about this. But if I'm understanding correctly, the horses' bodies make the antibodies to fight the bad guy, in this case, diphtheria bacteria. And when the horse blood is taken sorry, donated, by carting horses to the scientists and the medical folk of the day, the antibodies are extracted from the blood, purified, and injected into the infected patients where those antibodies get to work, like a targeting missile. They seek out the bacteria, neutralize it, and boom. The patient, usually kids in this case, gets better. Science! But science is a process. It's messy. It's often imperfect, or it's perfect on paper, and in execution, things happen. There's a reason today that they just don't pull horse blood from a horse, do a little magic behind the scenes, and shoot it into a person. And it has a bit to do with the lessons they learned from Jim the horse. And like all good science, the best science is an art. The best science can handle variables. Hard science, just the numbers, just the data, it's a great place to start. But I'd like to interject, if you don't make science an art form, things like what I'm about to explain can happen. On paper, the diphtheria antitoxin killed the diphtheria bacteria in humans. Yay! But horses are mammals too, with their own diseases, and the very diseases that they could fight for us because in this case their immune system could take a human illness, diphtheria, and make an antitoxin antibodies, magic fix-you sauce from their blood. It's important to note that they can get other things that infect humans too. Like, for instance, tetanus. What I'm about to say does not happen today. Not at all. And the reason it doesn't is because of the FDA that is in place because of what I'm about to tell you. 
In 1901, a little girl went and got her antitoxin shot for diphtheria. And she soon died after, not of diphtheria as she was being treated for, but of tetanus. Soon after, somewhere else in St. Louis, Jim the horse had to be euthanized, put to sleep, humanely killed. Because tetanus, a vaccine that for me hurts like the dickens for a couple days, but then is done for 10 years before my next shot, is much worse when it's actually tetanus. And it's something that horses and other animals commonly died of in the early 1900s, before the guys in white coats and behind local groups realized that Jim the horse was euthanized for having tetanus, Jim produced over seven and a half gallons of diphtheria antitoxin over the course of his medical side hustle while still pulling carts to bring milk to families in St. Louis before glass bottles were a thing. Before the doctors realized any of this, other kids started to die from tetanus. Then, the men in white coats from local companies connected the dots and discovered that the source of the tainted serum was in fact from the now buried Jim, the cart horse who gave his life to pulling carts, delivering milk, and making money for his owner by contracting diphtheria, and eventually died of tetanus. After the tetanus contaminated serum from Jim was released into the public, 13 kids died in St. Louis. 22 kids died in total because there was a similar issue with smallpox in another pocket across the country, contaminated in a very similar way for a very different medicine intending to help people. Jim's contribution to this medicine lives on. Have you contracted diphtheria? Probably not. This disease very, very rarely occurs in the U.S. and in Europe, where we have been vaccinated against this disease for quite some time. However, not every kid is as lucky. In nations who don't have the same resources as the United States, diphtheria is still common, where vaccination rates are low. Jim's story lives on in you right now. It lives on in the story of Balto and Togo racing against time and the very conditions found at the end of the world who got the diphtheria antitoxin, the same kind of antitoxin that was harvested in Jim the horse, to the kids and the native people of Alaska. Every time there is a recall of a medication, recall of food, a new vaccine rollout, or a new cell phone. Anytime your pet has to go to the veterinarian for medicine because he or she is injured or sick or ate something stupid. Every piece of equipment that is used, drug that is utilized, food that is consumed, sold, and produced all goes through the FDA, which was created when a horse named Jim, a horse who undoubtedly saved so many people, had a bad twist of luck a bad case of tetanus, and he didn't mean to kill those kids. The doctors didn't mean to kill those kids, but no one means to kill people with products we use, the products we eat, the products we sell, but things happen. We need the FDA to keep us safe, and for that horrible twist in Jim's life, the lives of the families of the 22 kids, specifically the 13 in St. Louis who died from tetanus that was in the diphtheria antitoxin from Jim directly and the other nine from the similar situation with smallpox and when their lives got twisted upside down and from those ashes came the arm of government who is now in the front line of defense to make sure we are all healthy that this does not happen again and if or when it does there's a protocol there are things we can do to stop the spread of illnesses, of diseases, and to help people. Because had there been someone, anyone, or a regulation to keep things in check, the serum dated from Jim on September 30th, 1901, was tainted with tetanus in the incubation phase of producing this antitoxin. There would have only been one death if someone had checked. Jim. <laughs> Furthermore, because what even is methodology? The same serum for September 30th was used to just top off bottles dated from August 24th, 1901. That's super not okay for exactly this reason. This would have been illegal. Bad protocol wouldn't have happened. Or if it did with regulations in place, there would have been consequences. But in 1901, we didn't know what we didn't know. And now we know. These failures and oversight led to the distribution of antitoxin that caused the deaths of 12 more kids. 
But as things tend to do in government, it was not perfect ever. And it was far from perfect in 1902 when the Biologics Control Act was put in place after the tetanus got into the antitoxin where the kids who were supposed to be saved died of something else entirely. And that wasn't perfect either. This act, the Biologics Control Act of 1902, was the first law in our nation's history that put federal regulations on vaccines. Food was still able to be sold with whatever hallucinogenic fungus, though I didn't read about this. I had my hands full with vaccines. And other medications, makeup, cell phones that didn't exist yet, were not yet under federal regulation. Why would they be? Eating fungus food is fun. Or not. Sorry, witches. For example, in the 1930s, muckraking journalists like Nellie Bly. Read about her. She's amazing. Muckrakers were journalists who were known for uncovering really dark things in society, like the treatment of people in poverty by actually living in poverty. The treatment of people in what at the time were called insane asylums, lunatic asylums, mental asylums. All terrible terminology today. We instead used the phrase psychiatric hospital. As laws in the wake of the kids dying from smallpox and tetanus from vaccines that were supposed to save them before we had protections in place, these muckraking journalists discovered products were allowed under early 1900s law. These, quote, safe, hashtag totes not safe, products included radioactive beverages, lash lore, which was a mascara that while making your lashes lengthen and your eyes pop, also caused blindness. Oh, so that's why the cosmetics piece ties in. See? Cures, with air quotes, that didn't cure anything, including sold for diabetes and tuberculosis. The law to fix these loopholes sat in Congress for five years. Man, the more things change. Jim's misfortune and the aftermath, the heartbreak, the outcry, the front page headlines established a precedent for the regulation of biologics leading to the 1906 formation of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA. But it would take nearly 30 more years before something was really done. But after public outcry and the hard work of these journalists bringing these cases to light, they still needed a little something extra. In 1937, we have what's called the elixir sulfonylamide tragedy. These poor souls, a hundred of them, consumed a drug, an antibiotic that they thought was safe, that they thought would save them, and that they thought would make them better. But it was actually a toxic, untested solvent. Immediately after this incident on the back of Jim the horse, pun totes intended, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act into law in June of 1938. For those playing the home game, that's almost 40 years after the incident with the antitoxin. So if you have been vaccinated, thank a horseshoe crab, we've talked about them before, and how these vaccines wouldn't physically exist without their blue blood and their LAL. At the very start of making these vaccines and the needles that inject the life-saving vaccines into your body so your super fighters can take on whatever COVID dishes out. But also pour one out for your homie, Jim the Cart Horse, who gave us, the FDA who oversees, the final vaccine. Grader Caden Griffin of Tennessee had a question. And all good science starts with a question. So he sat on this question for a bit and he thought about how we would get to the bottom of this. Do cat buttholes touch every surface in your home? I mean, who hasn't wondered that? Or rather, now that you've heard it, who isn't right now wondering that? So Caden did what every scientist has thought about at least once in their career figured out a way to get lipstick on a cat anus. For science. Not just any lipstick, specifically non-toxic lipstick, which I'm personally unclear where the toxic lipstick aisle is located at Sephora. He then just kept track of where the lipstick showed up around the house. 
I'm guessing if it was for science, he was actively checking. However, if it was done for fun on a Tuesday and he forgot about it, Mom for sure would have been keeping track of this and muttering under her breath the entire time. The results determined that cats with long and medium hair did not make any contact with hard or soft surfaces. Cats with short hair didn't make contact with hard surfaces, but there were smears of lipstick on soft surfaces like the bed. So sweet dreams, may visions of lipsticked cat anuses dance in your heads. You're welcome. So thanks for joining me today in Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, share and tell your friends. It's truly the best way to support the show. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, or what format you think that this show should take after our break, there are multiple ways to send in your ideas or let me know what you think of the show. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com, tweet at bewilderedpod, voice text or DM at Bewilderbeast Pod on Facebook or lurk Bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information regarding koala fingerprints from independent.co.uk, ripleys.com, and newscientist.com. Information on Oh my God, the horse gave us the FDA from the New York Times, Wikipedia, FDA.gov, allbetsinteresting.com, the Mayo Clinic, and the ToledoBlade.com, and Cat Butt Science, which is my favorite thing to say in this entire episode, from the Nerdist.com, MentalFloss.com, and BoingBoing.net. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Bye.